Hello, and welcome to Cabinet Conversations. My name is Paul Tatro, and I'm the director of Ford's Theater. If you're joining us for the first time, this is our live series exploring creativity, history, and leadership. You can learn more and explore our past programs by visiting our website, www.fords.org. We're just over a month away from the 2020 presidential election. Some have said the most consequential election ever. How to vote has been a topic of debate this year. Since America's founding, activism has sprung from debates of who has the right to vote. During the Civil War, Black leaders like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth pushed for not just emancipation, but full rights, including the right to vote. On April 11th, 1865, for the first time publicly, President Abraham Lincoln spoke of his support for voting rights for black soldiers. Hearing that speech, John Wilkes Booth vowed that that speech would be the Lincoln's last. Booth acted on that threat three days later at Ford's Theater. Booth was not the first nor the last person to react violently against expanded voting rights, especially for African Americans. When Ford's reopened as a working theater in 1968, it was envisioned as a space where both sides of the aisle could come together in mutual respect to seek enlightenment and entertainment. And it has remained such a place ever since. Voting rights are not a Republican or a Democratic issue. They are an American issue. Today, we'll talk about present day struggles for voting rights with our three distinguished panelists. Michael Steele became the first African-American elected statewide office in Maryland when he was elected Lieutenant Governor in 2003. He again made history with his subsequent chairmanship of the Republican National Committee in 2009. Steele is a political analyst for MSNBC and the host of Michael Steele podcast. He's a graduate of Georgetown Law Center an Aspen Institute Rodell Fellow in Public Leadership and a University of Chicago Institute of Politics Fellow. Steele also is co-author of the book, The Recovering Politicians, 12-Step Program to Survive Crisis. Eric Holder Jr. is chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee and served in the Obama administration as the 82nd Attorney General of the United States the first African-American to hold that office. As Attorney General, Mr. Holder defended voting rights, including the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and led the Justice Department's effort to overturn voter ID laws that suppress minority and youth votes. Jonathan Capehart is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and member of the Washington Post editorial board. He writes about politics and social issues and hosts the Cape Up podcast. He's also an MSNBC contributor, a regular moderator of panels at the Aspen Ideas Festival and for the Aspen Institute, the Center for American Progress, and at the Atlantic Dialogues Conference and the Brussels Forum of the German Marshall Fund. Welcome to each of you. Thank you for being with us today. As a reminder to our viewers, we're taking your questions on our social media platforms. Please feel free to submit them so that we may share your questions with our guests during the program. Gentlemen, thrilled to have you all here today. And now I turn the program over to Jonathan. Take it away. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and, and thank you, Eric and Michael, um, Mr. Attorney General and, and um, Mr. Chairman, for being a part of this conversation. The conversation is supposed to be about voting rights, and it is going to be about voting rights. But we can't have a discussion about voting rights without at least starting by talking about um, the threat to voting rights that is coming directly from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Yesterday, President Trump in the White House press briefing room was asked about the peaceful transfer of power. And he said, we're going to have to see what happens. You know that I have been complaining very strongly about the ballots and the ballots are a disaster. When pushed, he said, we want to get rid of the ballots and we'll have a very peaceful, there won't be a transfer, frankly, there'll be a continuation. 
Before flying off moments ago to North Carolina and Florida, the president was asked again, and once again, he refused to say that there would be a peaceful transfer of power. My question has nothing to do with his not saying there would be a peaceful transfer of power and everything to do with his saying that we want to get rid of the ballots. Those ballots are votes. And so I want to get each of you to um, just give me your thoughts on that, on having a president of the United States say such a thing and why it does or maybe doesn't concern you that it's being said. And I'll start with you, Chairman Steele. No, I, I think it's very concerning. Um, and first of all, let me just thank everybody for the opportunity to be here, uh, Ford's Theater, Paul, the, the entire team, uh, and pulling this together uh, for this discussion, which is very, very relevant, and very, very important. Um, I think we have to understand what where the president's uh, thinking um, is right now, and he's looking at an electorate that is um, animated, activated, uh, and and getting engaged. Um, unfortunately for him, he has not spent the last three and a half years as his predecessors have during their first term, building the case and the narrative for their reelection. And by that, I mean expanding the base of their vote. Um, knowing that you won with 46, 47 percent in the first term, given the economic uh, you know, realities as they were trending before uh, COVID-19 hit, um, the expectation is you lay that foundation a little bit tighter, a little bit stronger, and you build out that base. Having not done that, you're now confronting 40 some days out from the election with an activated base, which is largely organizing against you. So the idea when the president says, um, we don't want those ballots, he's talking about those folks who will be voting by mail, absentee. He, he said from the very beginning, he does not uh, trust those ballots. He think that they are corrupt. He think that they're fraudulent, even though he himself had voted say. not once but twice right. uh, by mail uh, from the Oval Office, both in the primary and the general election just this year. So that's what you that's what you're dealing with. So I think Americans should be very concerned and very put off by a president who would say that any ballot, uh, any legitimate ballot that is uh, received and cast by a voter somehow should uh, be discounted or not vote, uh, not um, put in play for the election, because that's that is the seedbed of a, a level of authoritarianism we've never seen in this country. And I think it's important that we all be aware of what it means, not just now, but in the future. And uh, Attorney General Holder, your, from your perspective, the idea that ballots, we want to get rid of the ballots. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, and let me also thank Fords for, for having me here uh, today and, and Jonathan as well. Uh, and, and Paul, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that at some level, I don't know, surface deep, Trump thinks he's going to lose. And so he wants to delegitimize the result that he is expecting in the hope that that will form the basis for him pulling something that will, in fact, uh, allow him to keep the, the presidency. Um, you know, the, the notion that somehow or other mail votes by mail are you know, are, are fraudulent, is inconsistent with the practice that we've seen all across this country. There are states, Oregon does all of their voting by mail, Utah. They do a lot of uh, vote by mail um, in, in Florida where the Republican Party has actually embraced that and used that um, to their advantage. So, you know, we have great instances of the use of the mails to cast ballots without any indication of, um, of fraud. The fact that you know this is notion that he says that it you know favors one party or the other inconsistent um, with all of the, the the studies that have been done it certainly raises turnout and that's a, a positive thing but doesn't tend to favor you know one side or or, or the other uh, and I, I share Michael's concerns I think we should be worried about a president of the United States um, in the way that he has and I'll be let's be honest you're also you know supported by his Attorney General. Um, saying things about, you know, foreign powers coming in and, 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 you know, filling out ballots and things of that nature. And then when asked, well, do you have any factual basis for that? He says, no, but it's common sense. Really? Common sense? You know, th those kinds of incendiary um, statements, those kinds of statements not backed um, by fact really hurts our democracy, potentially calls into question the results of the election. 
And we've got to, you know, call people out when they do that. But we also have to sensitize the American people so that they don't get swayed um, by these things that are just not factually accurate. Mm -hmm. So then when it, I mean, I can't get over the, the potential impact that it has on voters to hear that their votes, their ballots might not be counted. What do you say to those folks? I mean, voter participation in the United States is, is has been low. Yeah. And so it is already an effort to get people to go to the ballot box or even mail in an absentee ballot or mail in their ballot if they live in a state like, like Oregon. What do you tell people who might even still be on the fence about voting and they hear the president say, you know what, I don't know if you're, that vote's gonna count. Well, uh, what I say, and, and just I'm very frank about it, I've been working in this space for uh, most of my adult life, having served even on the, the NAACP Blue Ribbon Panel on um, election reform after the 2000 election. Um, in a bipartisan effort, um, making sure that every American has a full-throated, unweighted access to the ballot box in every form available, whether it is uh, same-day voting, vote by mail, absentee, overseas, um, uh, whatever it happens to be. Um, and, and so for me, uh, what I say to those Americans is, to be rather frank and honest about it, the president is lying to you. And, and I can say that because his own actions <laughs> dictate that. You cannot tell the American people, if you vote by mail, that's committing a fraud, but ignore the fact that I just voted by mail twice. <laughs> and, and so if the system is so corrupt and so damaging and so fraudulent, why did you participate in it? And why hasn't your administration reformed it during the preceding three and a half years after your election? You are the only president. He is the only president who actually questions his own victory. Uh, so there, there are all these elements that are swirling out here. And I, and I just like to get past that and just really help people understand uh, that your constitutional right to vote is guaranteed. And so there are many avenues that you can take. Um, I serve as chairman of the U.S. Vote Foundation. Go to usvotefoundation.org and click on your state and every bit of information you want uh, is there to not only figure out when to vote, but to get that ballot and get it returned. Um, so, you know, this is something that is, is inherent, it's important. Um, and the only thing you can do at this stage is be honest about what it is that's happening and the impact it's having on voters out there and to help relieve them of this concern that somehow if they request a ballot, that they're going to go to jail. That's not going to go to ha not going to happen. But what will happen if you vote twice, you'll go to jail. All right. <laughs> so let's be clear. Get your ballot. Vote once. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and what I tell people is that, you know, if you don't think that your vote is going to matter, that it's not consequential. Why do you think people are making it so hard for you? To vote? <laughs> trying to right. from voting, trying to say that your vote doesn't is not going to count. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, to the extent that you're going to get swayed by what people are, are saying, that this is somehow some huge impediment. Well, you think about the people who sacrificed, uh, who committed themselves, who gave their lives so that we would have the right um, to vote. You not only have, it seems to me, is what I tell folks, the, the civic responsibility, there's a debt that you have to pay by casting a, a ballot. So, you know, hearing things from, you know, self-interested politicians, mischaracterizations, that's the least of, of the problems that we should have. You know, you think about, you know, the, our late departed friend, John Lewis, and what he had to do so that people would have the right to vote. Well, civil rights workers in Mississippi, Viola Liuzzo. I mean, mm -hmm. think about those people. Uh, and so, you know, we've got to try to tune out all of these things uh, and, you know, be real participants in this democracy if we want to build a nation that we are, are capable of having. Hey, John, so, I think yeah, go ahead, Michael. I, I think what the general just said is so important. And, and just put, contextualize it for, for folks who are watching this for a moment. We just celebrated, what, 100 years out of the 244 years of this country, the right of women to vote. All right. We, we this year acknowledge 
the 60th anniversary that the citizens of the District of Columbia, of which I'm a native and where my parents still live, had the right to vote for president of the United States, 1960. So this, this franchise, America, is the most precious gift that we can give each other. I didn't say the government could give you. I said that we could give each other because our government is founded on the American citizen, not on one individual and not on any institution. We the people. So when you, this, this right is there, don't look at it as a gift horse and acknowledge and understand and appreciate how difficult, as the general said, how difficult and hard it was to get that vote. It took, it, I mean, this, this didn't start out with everybody getting to vote. Only white, well-landed gentry men could do it, right? Today, that's not our case. And yet there's some who wish it were. And the only way to breach that and to push back on that mindset is to get your ballot, vote once. <laughs> did you did you want to jump in, Eric, before I ask you? A no, I, I would say that you know the arc of this nation is that we are we become more inclusive uh, in, in terms of bringing more people in uh, into uh, giving people the ability to vote. At the inception of this nation, I saw a study that said about six percent of the residents of this country actually had the, the right to vote. You know, with racial barriers, mm -hmm. gender barriers, and property requirements. Uh, and, you know, we have gone on. So enslaved people got the right to vote. Women got the right to vote. 18 year olds got the right to vote. And I'm really concerned that that arc, which has been a very positive one, is in the recent years been trending the other way. I mean, between voter suppression, uh, gerrymandering, purging of voter rolls, unnecessary voter ID laws. Uh, this is a little inconsistent with the arc that this nation, uh, I think, proudly um, ha ha has been on. And the, the way to fight that is for people to take seriously the obligation that they have, the opportunity that they have, and put in place. Leaders will understand uh, that arc. Leaders who will um, buy into the notion that we should stay on that arc. You know, just because it's bad now doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. You know, you should, we have people who are gerrymandering, say, in, in Wisconsin. Well, guess what? It's, it'll be difficult. It'll be hard. But they can be replaced. And people who will understand what this nation is truly supposed to be about can take their places. Well, see, I'm glad you brought up the voter suppression efforts, because when 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 Michael said, you know, this government is, you know, by we the people. Well, some of we the people have been passing, you know, crafting and passing voter suppression bills that become voter suppression laws. Um, a lot of them coming out of one party, Chairman Steele, um, <laughs> in, in various states that have been prohibiting people to prohibiting people from the ballot box. So can we just have a, a conversation about one, the efforts to suppress the vote and two, the efforts to unsuppress the vote or to make it possible for these barriers to be broken down again? Because I keep thinking about, yes, our our dearly departed friend, Congressman John Lewis, you know, standing on that bridge, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge with him and looking on the other side and realizing, understanding what happened to him when he got to the other side of that bridge and why he was on that bridge in the first place to see that because of what happened there, the, the Voting Rights Act passed and now it, it's, been, it's been vacated and nothing's happening on it. And all of the things that he he and those 600 people marched for that first day are are under threat or have or have been eroded. Uh, since you referred to me, um, <laughs> I said we the people. I didn't say we the good people or or we the right people. Um, and that's that's part of this. That is that is why. Moments like this are so powerful as they have been in the past. Uh, whether it is the first time we give the, the, the black man the right to vote um, as we amend the constitution uh, in, during reconstruction, or we uh, are fighting now to get the, the voting rights bill out of, a uh, voting rights act out of the Senate majority leader's drawer. Uh, the Obama administration, uh, you know, had the opportunity to, to sort of reshape and try to fashion a, a, an effort 
in this space. Um, and as timing would have it, um, uh, the authorization, the reauthorization of that bill was has been stymied. Um, and the question every citizen has to ask is why? What are you afraid of? Why are you so afraid of people voting? I've always said from my very first moments in politics that if I have a good candidate and I can make a good case, I'm in the game to win every citizen's vote. And if I don't, then I have to learn from that. What is it that I missed? What didn't I hear? What did not understand? My response isn't, oh, okay, I have to just make sure next time they don't vote. Because that's antithetical to our value system in this country. And, you know, and a lot of people, you know, I'm sad to say, want to look at that as pie in the sky and just want to go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just, you know, Pollyannish. No, that's principle. When we dismiss principle as something Pollyannish or something that's like, oh, yeah, right. That's how we get where we are. And there's a great piece that's in the political magazine that's out by my, uh, Matthew McWilliams talking about American authoritarianism and how a lot of Americans like this. Mm -hmm. They like the suppression of certain votes, the votes of others, because they think they benefit from that. But as I like to tell them, baby, you're next. You're mm -hmm. next. Just because you don't, you, you don't want Hispanics to vote, <clears throat> you're next. Just because you don't want Blacks to vote, you're next, because that circle does complete itself once you get on it. So that's why we all together have to resist and have to push back and fight for full participation by everyone. So when you try voter suppression in Ohio and in, in Florida and in Michigan and any other state of the union, you are setting a stage and, and starting a process that at some point is gonna come back on you. And when it does, you're gonna look around and there won't be anyone there to help you because guess what? I can't vote. Right, and Eric, this is a good segue to, to what you're doing as chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee um, because, well, why don't you talk about what the NDRC is striving to do and how it, it could or will change a lot of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, I've been the chairman of the NDRC since its inception back in January of 2017. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that the redistricting process that will occur um, next year happens every 10 years, the year after the, the census. And that's a whole other conversation mm -hmm. um, that this process would be done in, in a fair way. Now, you know, we are focusing at the NDRC on a number of states, and I will be just blunt with you, the majority of those states, or all those states have problems because of what the Republicans did in 2011, the, the gerrymandering that they did at that point. Princeton has done a study and said it was the worst gerrymandering of the past 50 years. But to be fair, we've had uh, gerrymandering in this nation as long as we right. have been a republic, and Democrats have gerrymandered um, as well. And I stand against gerrymandering by Democrats as well as by um, re Republicans. And I've had to take on you know, people in my party in New Jersey, uh, in Maryland, uh, where they have done things that are inconsistent with the way in which I think um, these things ought, ought, to, ought to be done. So what we're trying to do is just to make sure that the districts are drawn in a fair way. Because through gerrymandering, you can create these safe districts that people serve in, and they're not worried, and this is at the state level as well as in the House of Representatives, people aren't worried about a general election in these safe districts, they're only worried about a primary. And that pushes people further and further to um, the extreme, to the right and to and to the left. Uh, it means that if you reach across the aisle to work with somebody in the legislature, that's seen as a sign of weakness and mm -hmm. potentially exposes you to a, a challenge. And so that you know that produces gridlock, which ultimately produce, produces cynicism by the American people because they don't see you know the legislatures or Congress um, you know moving in a, in a correct way. So this is this is something that really undergirds a lot of the, the problems I think that we see um, you know, in our nation. It's not a coincidence that you see the greatest amount of voter suppression in those states where you see the greatest amount of, of gerrymandering. You know, People get these seats and then they try to come up with ways in which they can keep themselves in power. Knowing that they are, for instance, 
you know, advocating for things that are not consistent with what the people want, but they're in safe districts, so there's no electoral, no political um, consequence. I mean, for example, you know, the vast majority of the American people want to have um, background checks when it comes to the, you know, the, the sale of guns. And yet, federal level, many of the states, you can't get that done, even though the American people want that to happen in overwhelming numbers, right? 70, 75 percent. And people in elected positions in these safe gerrymandered districts uh, can say, I'm not going to do that and suffer no electoral consequence, even though the constituents of that person, you know, want it to want it to happen. So that's what we're trying to do. Just make sure that the process in 2021 is a fair one. I don't want to gerrymand it for Democrats. I simply want it to be fair. You know, um, you just mentioned background checks when it comes to um, um, to the, the gun issue, which made me think of um, identification. And one of the things that Republicans are always saying is that, well, there should you should have um, um, voter ID in order to vote. And you, like, if you have to show the, the, the problem with that is that's always been the case. You know, I can't go into in California like in 1955. Let's say when there's no you know photo ID, I can go into California and say, "Give me a ballot." No, I had to prove who I was. But the deal was there are a number of ways in which you could prove who you were. You know, um, utility bills, rent receipts. There's a whole range of things. It got very prescriptive in this last go round of mm -hmm. photo IDs. You had to have a state issued um, identification thing with your your picture on it. Uh, you know, a driver's license. Well, we know that, you know, people in minority communities don't have driver's licenses to the extent uh, that people in other communities have. Or in Texas, where they said, all right, you have to have a, a state issue photo ID. Now, if you've got one that says you're allowed to carry a concealed weapon, that's fine. If you have a state issue um, a photo ID that says you're a student at the University of Texas, that's not fine. So, you know, there are a whole bunch of games that are, are being played here. But the notion has always been you always have to show that you are who you claim to be. One of the big problems, though, is that we have really restricted the number of ways in which you can prove that and then make it difficult for people to get access uh, to those measures. Yeah, I, I, this is where, you know, I, I think the journal and I are, are pretty much aligned, but I, I do separate a little bit uh, in this space. I've always advocated for some form of voter ID, certainly something that I, I was very strong on when I was Lieutenant Governor here in Maryland, um, that you know the state should take the responsibility, not the counties. And I know that this is, you know, voting is as, as local as you can get in many cases, um, but the state should take the responsibility to assist in, through a program or device, uh, getting those, those types of identifications primarily for citizens who, you know, the elderly and others, like my parents, I've got to go get new IDs for them now, right? Because theirs have expired um, so that they can, you know, do what they normally do. Um, but when you're looking more broadly at the issue of voting, um, there are some issues and there are safety guards that can be uh, put in place, I think, to mitigate against the narrative that there's fraud, to mitigate against the narrative that you're somehow cheating the system or that, you know, Jonathan voted twice or, or four times or, you know, whatever. And, and so my argument has always been, let's stop politicizing every damn thing that could be a potential solution and work through the solution and, and come to some, as, as the general said, voter ID has never been a suspicious character in the voting drama. It's just how we talk about it. And it's how we then limit or expand it in an unreasonable way. Uh, and, and so I think to the extent that we can begin to pull back a little bit from that and look at these matters a little bit more closely. Look, we had a big you know, election scandal here in Maryland in 1994 in our gubernatorial election where they mysteriously found some ballots at 11 o'clock at night locked in a schoolhouse in Baltimore City, right? Um, and it happened to be the precise number that they needed to flip what was then a, you know, four point Republican lead into a four point uh, Democratic lead. Um, so, yeah, there there is there is suspicion that is inherent in the system. There's suspicion that is uh, uh, born out of examples like I just gave. Um, and it's a time for our, our leaders, um, particularly given that this is a state function, it is not a federal function, it is a state function, that the states come together around the idea of creating at least a consistency from state to state to the <clears throat> they can bless you on things you. like having identification and what that identification is, because it makes no sense that I can 
vote with a gun license, right? Uh, a gun ID, right. but I can't vote with a student ID. Yeah. And that, that's the part that when people see that, they start trust, they stop trusting uh, the system. And that's why our participation rates have, rates have been so low. And you know, one of the problems with, with photo ID is that it's supposed to um, stop you know, in-person voter fraud. Now, the deal is, you know, the Brennan Center's done a study and says you're most like you're more likely to be hit by lightning than cast a, a fraudulent, you know, in-person ballot. You know, and we can't find, I mean, you look for all, where are all these instances of right. uh, voter fraud? You know, the, the statistical numbers are, you know, almost infinitesimal. And so I, I think, you know, we have to do a balance in here. We are trying to protect against something that does not exist, and potentially you are putting at risk the ability of people to cast a ballot. And that's the thing that makes this nation exceptional, you know, citizen participation. And we should never forget that. I think, that, you know, Michael's right. You know, people say we're Pollyannish. No, that's what America is supposed to be about. That's what makes this nation great. It's what distinguishes us from uh, other countries. It's what we fight for. You know, we were in Iraq. You remember the, those pictures of people with the, the purple, the purple. Around yeah. The yeah, fingers. Yeah, the ballot. I mean, think about that. We thought that was a great success. We're fighting we're, huge amounts of treasure. Our young people fighting to give other people the vote. We should have the same kind of determination and commitment to make sure that our own people have mm -hmm. the right to vote here um, in this country. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, we've gotten uh, quite a few questions that I want to that I want to work in. Um, one, let me scroll up here. It says here, twice this century, presidents have been elected without winning the popular vote, but the potential of a third time. What effect do you think that has on, on urging individuals to vote? And what, if anything, do you think can and should be done? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on that. Um, I think I think that that outcome is a very unwelcome outcome because people inherently and innately, despite the civic lessons that they may have had as a child, even though we don't do civics uh, as as well as I think we should today, um, to understand exactly how we elect a president, um, we we put a lot of stock and value into this ballot meaning something, right? And I take my time and I pour over and I'm reading all the, you know, the the ballot initiatives and, and looking up the candidates. And I check those boxes and I pick my choice for president. And, and then you go, wait a minute, what? <laughs> what do you mean I voted for an elector? No, I voted for a president. <laughs> I didn't vote. What, what's an elector? Who, who is it? Who is this person? Who are these people? Right. So this is this is what America uh, is confronted with. And so when you see, as we've seen now, and uh, as the uh, question references, two elections um, which uh, had uh, a popular vote in one for one candidate and an electoral college vote for another, um, it, I think it weakens the resolve of the American people. Um, to want to participate in a system where they believe this ballot, this ballot that they put out basically has no value to them. Uh, and we know that's not true, but you've got to deal with how people look at the system because that dictates how they participate. And one of the things that I've been very involved in is the national popular vote uh, in which we want to reform uh, the electoral college by having states enter into a national compact, very much like we do with the lottery, Right. So that uh, these states agree that um, the collectively they hold 270 electoral votes and that the winner of the popular vote gets the electoral votes for their states. If you're part of that compact, you commit just like I would commit as a Maryland citizen that when I play the lottery lottery, that a citizen of New York who's in that same lottery, my dollar can go to pay for that for that win his winnings or her winnings. Same thing here on the vote, that we agree that our electoral votes here in Maryland would, can, be, can go towards the Republican uh, winner of the popular vote, even though that Republican candidate may not mm -hmm. have won the state of Maryland. So there are reforms out there, um, and I just gave you one, the one that I'm involved in, which I think um, uh, sort of gets past some of the big constitutional hurdles that are, that right. are fraught with danger, but there are ways in which we can address this going forward. Okay, I wanna, I wanna stay on this one reform for a little bit because 
I've heard you talk about this before, about the national popular vote before, Michael. What I haven't done is have that same conversation with uh, Attorney General Holder. And I, he, I see his head nodding up and down as you're talking about the national popular vote. So this is something you, you like this idea. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think the cleanest thing would be to amend the constitution and do away with the electoral college. I'm not sure realistically that's something that we can do. I think the national popular vote effort where the states pledge to cast their votes, not for who won the state, but who won the national um, popular vote Correct. makes a big deal of sense. You know, the president is, is the one person who runs in this country that everybody thinks they're voting for. That's the one national offer. <laughs> we're, not, we're not voting for. <laughs> and if you had a system where you didn't, you know, count electoral votes, but you counted popular votes, you didn't do it state by state, Republicans would be campaigning in California, yep. in, in New York. Democrats would be campaigning in Texas to a degree that they don't now. Um, you would really nationalize the election. And that's what I think we should do. The president is supposed to be a national office holder. Now, that means, you know, that New Hampshire, Iowa, uh, you know, the battleground states that get a lot of attention now are maybe not going to get as, as much attention um, as, as they do now. But guess what? Most of the people are living in the places that now don't get the attention that right. they deserve. You know, Republican, Republicans should be campaigning in, in California and in New York. Democrats should be campaigning in, you know, Republican strongholds like, 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 like Texas. This is the kind of thing that just makes sense. Now, the Electoral College is a result of a, a whole bunch of compromises and, and things from the, you know, from the 18th century. Our Constitution was, is great, but it wasn't perfect. We have amended it when we uh, thought that was necessary. I don't think, as I said, a constitutional amendment here can happen. Um, with the speed that I think it is necessary. And so I think what Michael has talked about, the national popular vote is the way to go. It's something that can be done relatively quickly. And I think the last time I saw it, in terms of the state legislatures that have agreed to uh, participate, I think they're close to about 190, 195 votes. We are, exactly, General. We are 70 votes, 74 votes, electoral votes away right. from um, having a national popular vote election. My prediction, my humble prediction, especially after this election, <laughs> um, regardless of who wins, regardless of who wins, I think um, the 2024 election, we will have a full compact of states uh, totaling 207, at least 270 electoral college votes agreeing to a national popular election of the president of the United States. And for the record, Donald Trump himself has said that um, if there were a national popular vote in the 2016 cycle, he would have run a very different campaign because he would have had to. Yeah. He would have to have spent time in California, in Oregon, uh, in, in uh, New York, uh, Delaware, mm -hmm. New Jersey, because the goal is to amass numbers that total a majority of the vote. Uh, and so that would have meant that our Republican candidate or Democratic candidate, uh, Hillary Clinton would have been in Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee uh, to do the same thing. So it, it creates another level for the voters out there where they're empowered um, and we don't have a situation as we do right now where we are, the president is elected by 12 or 13 states and everybody else just kind of shows up. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, now you're talking all 50 states in the territory having a say in who the next president will be. You know, this is not a Republican Democrat thing in the sense that, you know, Democrats will be favored by this. People right. forget that George W. Bush had a popular vote lead over John Kerry that was pretty substantial. And if Kerry had won Ohio, 110, 115,000 votes more, he could have won the election, the presidency, although George Bush would have gotten more of the popular vote. Pretty substantial uh, margin in terms of the popular vote. So it's happened to Democrats in the last couple of times. It can just as easily happen to Republicans. Yep. Um, let me squeeze in a couple more questions because believe it or not, we are running out of time. Um, here's one, on November 3rd, or with early in-person voting, what do you do if protesters are blocking you from entering the building? You have any idea? Uh, I, I, so we've been working um, in this space. Uh, the National Task Force uh, on Election Crisis, uh, where I served as a, as a participating um, member, 
we've looked at various scenarios uh, that uh, could likely uh, play out, and one of them included uh, where voters are, you know, confronting some level of intimidation, et cetera, outside the, the polling place. Um, the most appropriate thing to do is stay calm. Don't, don't, don't look, there are going to be people who are deliberately there trying to pick a fight because they want that. They want that. They want, they want those images, just as we've seen people pick off on the narrative of protesters uh, who protest for 12, 13 hours peacefully, and then some dumb nut goes out at nine o'clock at night and burns a trash can, and that's the only image you see. Um, so we know that those people are there. So we're asking people to stay calm. There will be election officials that you can go to um, to say that you are being prevented from exercising your right to come into this building to vote and let them handle that. You get back in your line and you go into your into your voting booth. The last thing we need, which is what a lot of hotheads want, is fisticuffs out in lines and people cussing and throwing stuff and, and getting all surly and unruly because that then feeds the back end narrative people, all right? That see, this election was rigged. This election was fraud. Look at all of this violence. Look at all of this protesting. Look, you know, because they're not winning. Well, Michael, There's Michael, it's even, you need to be smart about that. It's even worse than that. It'll it'll be I'm sending in federal troops to yes. quell the to quell the unrest. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Eric, did you want to jump in on this or? Well, yeah, one thing I'd also tell people, you know, is to first off, you know, use use these things, you know, document this stuff. Get your camera out and take pictures of who's who's doing what. Uh, and if you don't see a resolution by people who are on the scene, you can get in touch with law enforcement. Um, you know, you can call the police. You can certainly call your local FBI. Who have, they have jurisdiction over these uh, these kinds of offenses. Uh, and to try to get. And again, I think Michael's point is extremely right, is extremely right. Do not think that you need to take self action. Uh, you know, try to work with the people who are there, officials who are on the scene. And if that doesn't prove to be adequate, um, get in touch with people in, in, in law enforcement uh, to try to, you know, create uh, an environment where people actually do have the ability to cast a vote. And here's another question. An absentee voter in California asks, can I assume that our state leaders will prevent any vote by mail attacks or should blue states worry too? I'm not sure I understand vote by mail attacks. I'm well, I'm, 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 let me see if I can divine what they're trying to say. I think it's in the, given the president's attacks on mail-in voting and absentee voting, will will state leaders move in to prevent, I don't know, the president from doing anything like impounding mail, impounding ballot boxes or impounding mail-in votes? I'll let the general go first on that one because that's more that's more in his box. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about kind of, you know, the nightmare scenario, the doomsday um, scenarios. Uh, you know, I, I think that my hope will be that, uh, you know, in spite of all the language they're hearing about, you know, the delegitimization of, um, of voting by mail, that the process will go um, well. I know that the Biden campaign is staffing up to deal with all the potential, um, you know, awful things that um, th that that could happen. Um you know, I, my hope and I, I think my expectation actually is that there's going to be a lot of talk about this and there'll be sporadic incidents around the country that by and large, though, you know, and overwhelmingly, actually, I, I think people's votes will be processed um, and, and will be will be counted. And it doesn't mean they're not going to be problems, you know, and I, I think we need to, you know, gird ourselves for that. We also need to gird ourselves for the fact that we might not know, you know, what the results are in a particular state on election night. You know, we might have, you know, Michael coming back the next day, um, you know, for his instant analysis. Well, it'll be instant over over a couple of days instead of, you know, yeah. just, like, just a last minute. But, you know, we, we can handle, we can handle that. You know, people tend to forget, you know, we have very short memories. In 2000, it was like, I don't know, 30, 35 days before we right. knew who the president was. And the republic survived. And, we, you know, we, 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 we handled it. So I think that um, we ought to be prepared. We ought to be careful. Um, but we need not create anxiety where there is not, um, you know, the need for it. But again, we need to be careful. And as I said, the Biden campaign, you know, I've talked to people there and I'm part of the effort there. Um, you know, we're trying to prepare for, you know, worst case scenarios, hoping that they that they won't occur. 
But unlike 2000, we have a president of the United States and an attorney general who, who are active participants, who would be, could be active players in whatever nightmare scenario happens. Michael Steele, you wanted to be a part of this. Yeah, I, I think the, the heart of that question is um, how much can we trust the states? How much can we rely on them? Are they ready? Are they capable and prepared uh, to deal with um, some of the shenanigans that uh, the president has at least alluded to and certainly as you just referenced with an attorney general who seems to be very, very comfortable with the president having an authoritarian uh, view of how this election should play out. Um, and, and, and I think that a lot of it um, revolves around the fact that, yeah, I think the states have this, I think they're, they're comfortable, uh, slightly uncomfortable, but they're comfortable. I've talked to a number of secretaries of states um, who are on their A game with this. Um, their frustration is that the Congress has not participate as uh, participated as fully as it should have. Um, those of us who were out there sort of pushing this this idea of getting getting the ballot secured in the age of COVID-19 so that that's the one stress voters didn't have to worry about about having to go out and stand in a line in the in the dead of night, you know, because it gets dark at four o'clock on the East Coast and at that time of year. Um, and, you know, it may be raining, it may be cold. Uh, and then, oh, there's COVID-19. Um, and, and so the people have the safety and security of being able to vote at home. And we asked the Congress for $4 billion for all 50 states in the territories um, so that they could put in place the infrastructure. The Congress gave us $400 million. The Republicans wanted it to be $100 million. <laughs> So there's that. Uh, but they got $400 million. But what they've been able to do with those resources has been phenomenal. And I think whether you're in California, you're in Florida, you're in Maryland, my home state, the District of Columbia, where my parents live, uh, New York, wherever you are, um, I think you can, you can feel a little bit more comforted that the states do recognize what lies ahead and have taken the precautions uh, by working together across the, across the country, state to state, sharing information, sharing strategies uh, to try to avoid uh, a complete collapse uh, come November 3rd. Yeah, and our uh, bottom line here is that I don't want people to get so nervous about what's going to happen that they don't participate in the process. Right. You know, I think everybody, you know, make a plan, vote early. If you're going to vote by mail, send it in early. If you're going to vote in person, use um, early voting to the extent that you can. You know, we talk about flattening the curve when it comes to um, the virus. I think we need to flatten the curve when it comes to voting. Don't everybody show up or cast their ballots during the day, <laughs> day of the election, the day before. You know, flatten the curve. Let's vote um, as early as we can so we help the system um, deal with this, you know, unprecedented number of votes that we're going to be getting um, th through the mails. Uh, real fast, because we have about two minutes left, but I do want to get this question in, and I don't know if either of you can answer this, but the person asked, please address the issue of signatures and matching them on mail-in ballot, mail, mail -in ballots when one signature changes from the time one registers. This part of the question I don't get. Are there specific signatures for matching? But I'm sure there are people out there who might be worried about the whole signature thing. Do those rules differ from state to state? Is there something they can do to ensure that they don't get jammed up because their signature has changed because when they registered, they were 18 and now they're 40? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of requirements, you know, signature matches, witnesses uh, who have to uh, say that the person who claims to be Eric Holder and submitting a, a mail ballot, a uh, mailed in ballot is in fact um, Eric Holder. And, you know, we filed lawsuits. The NDRC has filed lawsuits in North Carolina, Texas, Minnesota. We just reached an agreement with, with uh, folks in, in North Carolina so that we have, um, you know, we want to make sure that there's no fraudulent um, activity there. But we also want it to be reasonable so that, you know, we, you have signature matches. But, yeah, my signature looks different now than it did when I was, you know, 20, 25. That was only 10 years ago when I was 25. <laughs> so uh, I'm an embryo. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> and so we want to be reasonable about this. We don't want to have, you know, some penmanship 
expert coming in and saying, well, you know, the, the, the E is written in a, in a different way and therefore don't count, don't count that ballot. It's all a question of just being reasonable uh, in applying these requirements that make, you know, make, make, make sense. My signature is different from last week. So <laughs> I think that's true for most Americans. And, and, but the states, to, to Eric's point, do have backstops. So, you know, other ways of verifying that ballot beyond the signature. Um, now, some states want to be sort of a holish about it uh, and use that very strictly. Um, and you know who you are out there. Um, and Eric's going to be coming for you <laughs> <laughs> if you don't fly right. Um, but in that instance, you still have the right to challenge. Just because the state the state goes, oh, I'm sorry, we're not accepting your ballot. No, no, time out. Tell me why. And, and let's, you know, so... Hopefully it doesn't come to that, that those backstops, those other measures to verify your ballot um, before they before they get to throwing it out because the E looks funny than it, you know, funnier than it did 20 years ago. Um, what those processes will work and, and your ballot will be uh, counted. But here's the thing. Don't let that stop you. Um, you know, get your ballot, get it early, vote once. Yeah, and you know, and states, you can also monitor what's going on with your ballot. You send it by the mail. You yep. can get to see where is it in the process. And if there is a problem, you should have the ability. Well, states allow this for you to cure any defects. So they say, well, this E doesn't work, and you're going to need to come down here and you know prove that you are Eric Holder. Something like that. There are a number of ways in which states give you that opportunity. But one of the things is to monitor what's going on with your ballot. And a lot of this stuff is online. So you can see uh, ballot received, ballot in process, ballot rejected, ballot accepted. And it'll happen you know, oftentimes before the election day. So you'll have the ability to get there, uh, right. correct the problem if there is one. This has been a great cabinet conversations. Uh, thank you very much, Eric Holder, 82nd Attorney General of the United States, Chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, and also Michael Steele, former chairman of the Republican National Committee, former lieutenant governor of Maryland, former chairman of the Maryland Republican Party, and current host of the Michael Steele podcast. Thank you both very, very much for engaging in this conversation. Paul, you're coming back. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, you know, I know you all warned me that you guys could fill two hours. I have no doubt that. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry we had to cut you off short. Uh, I'm glad Michael used a theater term in his last answer there, a-hole. That's something that we use <laughs> in the theater a lot. It brought it right back to the theater. So thank you so much for that, Michael. Uh, I want to thank Jonathan Capehart. Just a brilliant job today, Jonathan. Thank you so much, you, General Holder and Chairman Steele, and thanks to all of you who are watching. We will continue to re uh, respond to your Facebook and Twitter comments and questions that we didn't get to during the live session today. I want to tell all our listeners today, make sure you have a plan to vote. As a reminder to our local neighbors, the big deadline for voter registration in D.C., Maryland, Virginia is October 13th and DC residents can even register in person on election day. Be sure to look up your state's voter registration requirements and deadlines soon. Check out the website on our thank you screens following the program to learn more and to make your plan to vote. If you like today's cabinet conversation, consider making a gift to help support the mission and the work of Ford's Theater. You can do so at fords.org slash donate. Your donation allows us to bring you more programs like this today. Thank you so much. We hope to see that you'll all join us for our next cabinet conversation on October 8th. We'll see you all next time. Gentlemen, thank you very much for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.